to Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is Miss Christine Bish, running for Congress, and author extraordinaire, Mr. John Cameron. What kind of books are you writing these days, John? Uh, right now I'm writing a science fiction book. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. Right, we'll, we'll, we will look forward to that. Interference. We will look forward to that uh, when it comes out. That I think you'll like the theme of. Yeah, yeah. And this thing is driving me crazy. All right, but what we like the theme of is Mr. Richard Fields. And as I said, that thing was going to get thrown away, and it didn't even make it halfway through the show. All right, we have a Mr. Fields is talking about meddling in other countries this week, and so let's see what Mr. Fields has to say about meddling in other countries. Mr. Richard Fields, report from the Fields Fields. Fields, yes. Hi, this is Richard Fields with this reports, this week's report from the Fields. Hamas leader Ismail Hanaya was recently killed while he slept in a compound controlled by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's widely believed that the responsible party for carrying out the assassination was Israel. This, the Israeli government has neither confirmed nor denied those reports. Hanaya, a peace negotiator for Hamas, was in Iran to attend the inauguration of Iran's new president, Mazoud Pezeshkian. Pezeshkian was elected on a platform of seeking peace for Iran. He defeated the candidate supported by the Revolutionary Guard. The Guard epitomizes the hardcore death to Israel faction within Iranian internal politics. Since the attack, Pezeshkian has advocated a measured response by Iran, attacking Israeli forces in places like Azerbaijan or Iraqi Kurdistan. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard is advocating direct hits on Tel Aviv and other targets within Israel. Of course, the final decision will be made by Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. After all, Iran is still an autocracy. The primary interest of the United States in this conflict should be to be limited to diplomacy, aimed at limiting the possible possibility of escalation of hostilities in Israel's conflicts with Iran and Iran's proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis in Yemen. Israel is a nuclear power. Iran, maybe, we really don't know for sure. A nuclear conflagration in the Middle East could easily escalate worldwide. It's tempting for politicians to pick sides in conflicts like this and form alliances. Culturally and politically, we have more in common with Israel, and we should certainly put no constraints on the ability of our arms manufacturers to do business with Israel. But we should not also be buying weapons for Israel. The Israelis have demonstrated over the years that they are quite capable of defending themselves against all threats. They no, don't need our further economic assistance. By electing the relatively moderate Pazeshkian over the more hawkish Revolutionary Guard-backed candidate for president, the voters of Iran have indicated that they are more interested in peace and prosperity than they are in death to Israel. That's a sentiment that needs to be nurtured and encouraged, not manipulated for short-term tactical geopolitical gain. That's this week's report from the fields. I'm Richard Fields. See you again next week. Thank you, Richard. That's always insightful. But let's join us for the reason we are here tonight. Okay. So you know, I first met you, oh God, what was it? Was it four years ago or was it six? Anyway, I was running, thinking of running for office and I had, a friend of mine had taken me to a Republican meeting. And this okay. uh, Republican meeting, just he was a Republican, so he took me over to a Republican meeting and uh, you were there. And I could tell by that day you did not play well with the people, with the people in the Republican Party. <laughs> Getting so much trouble. <laughs> which, which is actually why you're here, because one of your, I was hosting a booth down at the State Fair a few uh, a month ago, yes. and one of your volunteers stopped by, and I was surprised. I was always surprised that you weren't better supported by the local Republican Party. And so it was, we had a short conversation, next thing you know, you you left a message on my phone, and now you're here. And now I'm here. So, but I know you as Chris. So let me t tell us a story about the difference between Chris and Christine Bish. Okay, the story about Chris and Christine. I was born named Christine, 
And the only one who called me Christine was my mother and the principal. Mm. And that's when just- When you were in trouble. When I was in trouble, oh, exactly. Yeah. Other than that, I was itty bit. But what happened was we, we ran the first campaign against Doris Matsui and, and I did very well and there's a whole nother story about that. But in the 22 race, uh, we had a lot more volunteers, a lot more excitement, and my volunteers were telling me, Chris, you need to use Christine. People do not know whether you are a man or a woman. So, um, yeah, I'm saying, you know what? Everybody knows Chris could be a man or a woman. This isn't a problem. So we're at the county fair, and I'm passing out flyers, say, please vote for Chris Bish for Congress. And I approached this man, gave him a flyer, and he says, I love Chris. He's the best candidate. You can let him know that he's got my vote. And I said, and of course, I can hear the volunteers laughing behind me because they're right. And I said, you know what? I'm going to let him know that he has your support. Thank you. And so when I decided to run again, that's when I heeded the advice of people that I trust. And, uh, you know, Mom... I'm not in trouble, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, running for politics does put you in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. It gets you on the wrong side of many powerful parties, many powerful interests, if you're running for a genuinely good cause. And so speaking of that, why are you running? What decided you to run against Mr. Omni Berra this year? Omni, Omni Berra, I keep, saying it, I keep putting it in in there. Well, it's it could, Omni Berra, I know It this. could be Omni like omnipotent, because he I, thinks he is, that's appropriate. <laughs> I oh, I gotta hang out with you more. <laughs> <laughs> Thinks he can do no wrong. Speaks for the people that he's so out of touch with. But I'm, I'm stealing your campaign. No, slogan, no, it's so, yeah. you know you're singing my tune. Mm -hmm. It's he is out of touch with the people. Recently, he just did this photo op with some Republicans and Democrats, and in the photo op, he's standing there with this big check. You know, it looked like something from The Price is Right. Mm -hmm. And up in the, you know, who, the maker of the check, it's got his name. And then down in the bottom, you know, it's like, I think it was like $27 million for a road project. And like he gave it to us. Um, and I'm thinking, wow, you know that withdrawal from Afghanistan because he's the uh, ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee? Well, our budget for that year, I think it was, it was around $800 billion, our military budget, and we left about a tenth of that in military equipment. A tenth of our military budget was left in Afghanistan, and in an interview that he did, I believe it was Stars and Stripes, he says, now is not the time to point fingers. It's to figure out what we did right and what we did wrong. Well, Mr. Barrow, what we did wrong was elect you. <laughs> there we go. You know, you rubber stamped it. And then he's continued to go on, you know, like the road project, $27 million. And that was from that, you know, so-called infrastructure bill. Well, I pulled his record. Guess what? He wasn't even there to vote for it. He, he uh, sent a letter and said that for health reasons, I'm, you know, I, it, it, he had already survived the rabid fox you know, biting him. So it wasn't that, and COVID was over. But he wrote a letter and said that he couldn't be there and gave his proxy, I think it was Byers out of Alabama, uh, one of those southern states, who actually voted for Ami Berra to give us that monstrous infrastructure bill so we could leave billions of dollars of equipment for our enemies in Afghanistan to use against us and I don't know, whatever foreign war they decide. Yeah. Well, I don't know, I want some of that $27 million to fix the street so in front of my house. There his, you go. Was his name on the check? Oh, well, we're still looking. Yeah. No, <laughs> well, it, was on the, it was on the road check, uh, you know. I, I want to try and cash that check. Yeah, I, do, I want to cash it. Yeah. Let's, let's, <laughs> see, let's see how much money he's got in his slush file. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll have to ask dad, I think he's out of jail. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so what are your big three issues? I big mean, three issues. I mean, let's put, the, let's put your opponent aside for a minute because when I ran for office, I always decided I'm not going to have an opponent. I'm just running for the office. I, I like that. And, and the big thing is we're living it. It's the economy. And James Carville said that. It's the economy, stupid. He told that to Bill Clinton. And, and it has never been more true. 
when we've got people who can't afford food, they're deciding between medication and a disconnect notice on a utility. Everything is more expensive. And, and it's not necessary. It reminds me of Jimmy Carter and the gas lines. Magically, when we elected Ronald Reagan, we didn't have gas lines. You know, it's like some oil genie just came up and, and set us all free. Of course, you know, we had a lot of repairs to do. And uh, Biden and Harris, uh, under their administration, and all of the things that my opponent wanted, we got it, and, and it is hurting us. It is hurting the people who can least afford to be harmed. No Low income, seniors, homeless people. Yeah, I have young fa children with families, you know, uh, young children with families. <laughs> children with young families. <laughs> Good yeah. Lord. This is going to be one of those days. So I have children with families, and you know, they're, um, you know, they're, they're out struggling. A, a, a two-bedroom apartment for a family of five. Right, and it's costs what thirteen hundred dollars a month, and that's, you're talking that's that's cheap. cheap for oh my God, uh, that is cheap. No, 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 it's not cheap. It's where they live. Uh, Remember, this rent is rent control. No, it's not rent control. It's the ghetto. You know, <laughs> it's you're living in. You have to. You end up living in um, in houses that are say barely habitable, buildings that need maintenance. Right? We call mm. them. What's the word I'm looking for? Slumlords. Mm. Right. Now, slumlords actually serve a purpose, right? They have that low-end housing for housing that people who have can't get houses anywhere else, right? When you're, when you're a 27-year-old person who has failed in life twice already and you need a house for your family, you know, you're not going to get an institutional investor to, to rent you that house. But you, you have, know you're what? You're going to find a slumlord to do it. It's not just a 27-year-old. Yeah. See, my mom, single mom, dad, you know, Dad got himself in trouble from time to time, and I was living in a car as a kid, more times than I can't care to remember. But my mom got one of those houses in Del Paso Heights, and I remember it was on Bay Drive, and me and my younger sister, we had the garage that was converted into a bedroom, so we didn't have heat, we didn't have air conditioning, but I had a bed, and I got to go to school. And to me, it, it, it was a rundown house, but it was a house. I wasn't sleeping in a car. So did it need repairs? Yes. Did, was the neighborhood bad? Yes. But I had the basics that I needed. And we grew up on, on assistance. And sometimes, you know, we were high times we didn't need it. Other times we did. So I guess it's how you look at it. They have a place. So many people are homeless. And not just children, not people that are addicted. Um, I've helped seniors uh, get into um, housing uh, out of my own pocket, uh, found benefactors for other ones. So it, it's, it's more than that. And sometimes what you and I consider a slum. Yeah, it's, it's the only it's, place they can afford. You know what? It, for me, it was wonderful. It is. And I didn't realize how bad it was because it was better than where I was. No, we used to, we had a, a house that was about a block from the vineyards down in Fresno. Mm -hmm. We rented a house about down there. And it was about a block. So every time they'd spray the vineyards, all the bugs and stuff would come. Uh, yep. <laughs> it would come flooding the house. There was no, there was no air conditioning. This in Fresno, there's no, no, air, air, conditioning. no air conditioning yes. in Fresno. Well, and, all the bugs flapping their wings. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fresh air. But, you know, it was a house. We had a white picket fence. The house was run down, but the fence was a nice little white picket fence, so you had a nice white picket fence, and the kids don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. All the kids know is they have a building that's filled with love, and that's what the kids need. Yep. And this, what's the sad thing is today is how do we solve the problem of them not allowing us to build enough houses? Now, because that's the single major problem with housing costs, right? There's simply not enough units being built in order to cover the cost. But in California, there's the problems of water, right? So how do we balance the needs of water versus the needs of we need to build more houses so people can actually afford to live? Well, okay, so California, housing is disproportionately expensive. And so a six, I'm just gonna throw out some numbers, a $600,000 house. Uh, new construction in Sacramento or, you know, California 
half the cost of that house is spent by the builder before they even break ground. And that's with fees and assessments and permits and you name it, anything that they can tack on to the price of the house. So a $600,000 house here is maybe 400,000 in another state or even less. And it's part of it is our legislature, our county supervisors making up for Prop 13. And I remember Prop 13. Uh, we were living hand to mouth, you know, in that little house out in Del Paso Heights. And I remember my mother telling me how important it was that that was happening because there were senior citizens who were being taxed out of their homes, mm -hmm. houses that they had paid off. And because the taxes were going up so much that their homes were being seized and foreclosed on because they couldn't pay the property taxes. And I learned this in the fourth grade from my mom. It's you can't tax yourself or tax a society into prosperity. And so this is how the legislature worked its way out. So how do we solve it? One, we've got to get uh, all of these middlemen out of the way. and come up with regional building codes, regional standards, and these permits. We just saw the Supreme Court rule in, in favor of a man in El Dorado, uh, El Dorado County, where they went after him for some permit because he wanted to build an extra structure on his property. And it made it to the Supreme Court, and it says, you know, what they're doing, the way that they're uh, taxing us and permitting us, it, it's, it's causing this housing crisis. You know, solar is mandatory in California now on new houses. Well, it's not mandatory the rest of the country. And we're seeing solar companies going out of business. Uh, we did that, remember Solyndra and all those companies? Um, this, is, this is a scam. I mean, you know, all of these requirements. Now they're trying to force everyone to get off of uh, natural gas, which is clean, it's cheap, and it's abundant but we want to get everybody on electricity so we can pay a higher bill to buy it from, I don't know, Idaho, yeah, Montana, Washington, Washington well, everybody else that can produce electricity so we can maintain this facade that we're not burning gas, we're not burning coal to produce electricity. It's, it's a scam. So this is one of the things that, that we can do is... Um, I believe from Congress is with the power of the purse is offer relief to builders and do it through subsidies. Not that I like giving away money, but you know, sometimes you got to work your way through things to get where you need to go. And it's where we have regional building codes. We know Sacramento, we know what the weather is like. You know, rainy years and, and drought years and everything else. So we can build our homes based on the region. Now, Sacramento, this is the city of trees, but they're forcing houses to have solar. But then we have the electric company, SMUD, giving people free trees to put shade over the house so the solar doesn't work Yeah, we, in about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they've been doing the, the tree thing for, in, for SMUD for as long as I can remember, and, which is, it's great to plant all the trees, but yeah, if you plant the tree to cover your house and then you can't put solar panels on your house because they're only going to be 60% effective or whatever. Exactly, and, and I'm a tree hugger, by the way. I never met a tree I didn't like. I always say, I love, you know, people think I, I'm against learning how to live cleaner, and that is com not, com I'm against the government mandating how we figure out how to learn to live cleaner. I oh. want us to live cleaner. I, I, I don't want to take away from your time because it's important to get your message out. But the government mandating, mandating anything is wrong because people in government uh, aren't in touch with reality. Like this industrial policy that, that, uh, that the government wants to do now, anytime any country's ever had an industrial policy, it has resulted in the inefficient use of resources and people. It's, it's uh, uh, resulted in, in uh, higher costs and lower mm -hmm. quality products. What you do is you let the market decide. Yes. But, um, some, the, the, the conservative estimate for the cost of regulation in this country is $3 trillion a year. 
And I bet if you look at all of the states and then look at California, our proportion of regulatory cost related to other states is through the roof. And then we have all of the construction companies are required to basically use um, union labor. And if they're not required to use union labor, they're required to play, pay prevailing wage, which is union labor wage, which means they might as well use union labor. And that's the whole reason for prevailing wage, because the unions own the state of California, especially the teachers union. So um, the, the deregulate, deregulate, deregulate. The, the, the government will spend all the money that it has and then some. So the idea that they need all these fees and permits and everything mm -hmm. to make up for anything is foolish. Like they talk about the reason schools are so crap is because of that same proposition. But it's not that they're crap because of that. They're crap because basically they are a retirement vehicle for teachers. And that's where all the money is going. So the money, any money you give them is not going to go into better schools, better classrooms. It's going to go into retirement fund for, for teachers and paying their medical care and all the rest of that and paying for layer upon layer upon layer of administrative staff. That's okay. where it really gets eaten up is yeah. the administrative uh, uh, costs. Now, going back to the environmental policy, think about this. If you're a libertarian, uh, independent, Republican, we are the stewards of the earth. We're the ones that are biking and camping and fishing and, and hunting and boating and, and working with the forest department. Uh, you know, those are the people that are out there, yet our environmental policy is being led by people who live in concrete jungles, who will drink recycled toilet water and willingly step over human feces. That's a problem. Yes. It, it, and, and it's funny when you hear it put in those words and then you start thinking about it. You know, it, you don't see someone who is, uh, wants to leave a forest unmanaged fighting forest, forest fires. You don't see one, someone who insists that we, you know, not cut down trees hiking, working for a lumber company, and, and it's responsible. We have more trees now than ever, you know, since, since we've colonized this country. And, and that's a good thing because the poison that we expel, the trees love it, and, you know, and they give it back. You know, there's a lot of love going on, giving us the oxygen that we need to breathe. You know, that's a fundamental rule of, of <laughs> physics, right? Uh, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So, yes. Yes, and, it, and it, it's not just physics. It actually applies to people. And so that brings me up to another point. I say we have an activist problem in government right now. It's we have people in both politics and the bureaucracy who are more activists than representatives. And so if... Assuming you get to office, how would you make people who, who are necessarily not aligned with you feel represented? Yeah, you know, and, and that's the balancing act. Because right now, there's a whole lot of people that are supporting me, that have voted for me, who do not feel represented. Because you know, whether it's, it's a life issue, an environmental issue, uh, a big fat check for a road project that you did not write, or the military equipment that was left overseas just abandoned for our enemies. Uh, you've got to take in everybody and make reasonable decisions. And it's going to be my life experience, the people that are around me, you know, the people who talked me to use uh, Christine instead of Chris on my campaign. It's You've got to be open to new ideas, and it's not a flip-flop. It's about education and being willing to learn and, and listen to what other, other ideas, other opportunities. And that's one of the exciting parts about being here, uh, talking to the Libertarian Party. I am a Republican. Uh, I've been a Republican since I was 18. But so many of the things that I know are true, not everything, but some of the things that I know to be true are embraced by the Libertarian Party. And I appreciate that. And, and it's, it's that positive uh, just discussion, open ideas, and finding out what we can do to improve society without controlling people. 
We've got about three minutes or so left. John, do you have any, anything you want to? No, I just want to, I want to tack on to what Christine said, because um, I know the way Chris is spelled, that it's a girl, um, so a woman. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I had no problem with that. Yeah, uh, Guy Chris is spelled a different way. So, um, but, uh, so if we look at that $80 billion worth of equipment that was sent there, I wonder how much of it got in the hands of Hamas. Yeah, because they they share the the ideology that that uh, 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 Jewish people haven't lived where they're living now for three thousand three hundred years or so. It's like they're new and they're evil somehow because they don't they don't profess to believe the same way. I wonder how much of that money got in the hands of people who who uh, killed. I don't know, 1,200 people and chopped the heads off of people and, and took them as hostages. Stole babies out of their beds, and, yeah. And, uh, and uh, then right before they got captured, uh, video taped them being executed. I wonder how much of that, that money got there. So uh, I do remember, I'm not a big Trump fan, but uh, um, Trump basically promised, look, we're going we're gonna to get out of Afghanistan, but we're going to do it on our terms, and we're going to make sure that, the, that you don't, kill everybody in the country and had a plan and and if you look at some of the things he said that the the democratics would say are completely lies to to the leadership of the taliban basically said no you're not going to kill americans uh and we're going to get out of there and and give the country back to you but we're going to make sure that you don't kill our former allies and we're going to do it in an orderly manner and all the rest of that and then a man that we have since found and many of us knew uh, was slipping away for years and years and years, just pulled the plug, threw the plan out the window that would allow for base, basically a peaceful transition to some kind of government there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many people were beheaded or killed, but I know uh, there's an awful lot of new Afghanis that I welcome with open arms in Sacramento that would be dead if they were still there because of... Um, Basically, stupidity, stupidity at the highest command. And I don't want us to be in foreign wars. I'm a former paratrooper. I'm a, I'm a patriot. I swore to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. But we don't need to be the world's policemen. We don't, that's not our job. What we need to do is spend less money and, and make a good life for people in this country. Our job is to be the example for the planet. Uh, is to be the example We're not of, that now. Uh, we're not that now. It's a nice way to wrap up. We've kind of wrapped up the show with the way Richard introduced the show. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out that, you know, Afghanistan may very well be the best armed country in the Middle East right now. Mm -hmm. it's so, you know, thanks to how we pulled out. We want to thank you for joining with us. Thank you, Christine, for being here tonight. Thank you, thank John, you. for joining us. We want to thank the crew thank in there for working much. very hard, as always. And thank you for watching. So please have a good night. And please remember to love everybody. Especially those that don't appear to need